this before I start. God, I just thank you for this day. You give me up this morning, give me the strength today to move on with another day, another yes. life. I just ask you to be with each and every person in here, be in our hearts. And just if anyone can get anything out of this message, please receive it and use it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, first of all, a lot of y'all don't know me. My name is Joseph Scott. Mm -hmm. I was born in Springfield, Ohio, to Pamela Jean Scott. Um, I'm biracial. My father was black. My mother was white. I really, like a lot of children out in the world today, I really don't know my father. All I know is when I was five, six years old, my mom used to tell me, let's go see your dad. He's going to give you some money. So quite naturally, a child is going to jump in that car and go see their father. But growing up, I had a, I had a good life. I wasn't, we wasn't poor and we wasn't rich, but I was spoiled and I got what I wanted and got what I needed. Uh, there was a lot of alcoholism in my family. My uncle was an alcoholic, my brother was an alcoholic, my mother never smoked, drank, nothing. My stepfather was an alcoholic, my real father was supposed to be an alcoholic. When I was real young, he, uh, he had committed a murder and was gone most of my life, so for approximately 13 years I, I never had no more contact with him. And it, it was uh, it was real stressful, painful. I had a lot of anger in me because I didn't know my, my father like every other kid did when they was in school and they had Father's Day and stuff. I didn't have my father there with me. I'm just like any other kid nowadays. Like, where's my dad at? I try to see my kid now. When they have Father's Day, I try to be there for him because I missed it when I was young. And growing up, when I was real young, all I can really basically remember is when I was about seven years old, the first thing I know I, I did was stole, and I know it was wrong, and I, I bet you if I gave any one of you people out there any any suggestions what I stole that would nobody guess what I stole. But I'm gonna tell you it was a <laughs> it was a it was a little thing of a chocolate icing. <laughs> so quite naturally a lot of y'all might have known what I stole. It had something to do with food. <laughs> that was the first bad part of my life. And then once I turned about eight, nine years old, my mother took us took us out of out like of the suburbs, and we moved over towards what everyone now would consider the projects. But where I'm originally from, Springfield, Ohio, we really didn't have a project. It was low income housing, and so once I started hanging around the wrong crowd, things started to get really bad because. From seven years old all the way up to 13, all I can remember doing was still. And I knew it wasn't right, and I didn't really even have no reason to steal. Because my mother got me everything I wanted. I had new shoes every month. I had new bicycles. I had mopeds. I had motorcycles, dirt bikes. I had about everything I wanted, but just to be accepted to the other people in the neighborhood, I had to do what they wanted. So that was steel. And then when I got 13, 14 years old, I was introduced to alcohol. And back then, a lot of y'all, the older generation, probably remember Wild Eyes Rose, Mad Dog 2020, <laughs> and all that. Well, I was, I was in a, introduced to that. And then for some reason, God bless my mother, but at 14 years old, my mother uh, said she would rather see us drink in the house than to be out in the street. So I thought it was all right, like most kids would. Just, you know, your mom said it's all right, just drink upstairs. But then once that happened, you know, things turned into 
from drinking upstairs at 14, 13 and 14 and 15 year old to going to the, the football game and drinking out there and then came the trouble. And I remember once I turned 15, 15 and a half, that uh, I was with a bunch of crowd. And, um, we was all drinking, going down the street. Seen a bunch of people. Well, we seen a, a man, a woman, and a couple other people, and we just we started some trouble with them. And I remember picking up a, a bottle, and flinging the bottle, and all I remember was this lady hollering, "Ah!" And I knew I done did something bad, so we all started running. And then um, once I, I was about a block away from home. Everybody else broke one way, and I broke the other way trying to get home, and I got caught. And that was my first time with, with a serious felony. And because of the nature of the crime, they sent me away to BYS, which is in Columbus, Ohio. So when I first got sent away as a juvenile, it kind of it kind of hurt me because all that my mother did for me all the things she bought me and she just couldn't understand why I acted out the way I did but as I think back now and you look at life that alcohol really had a lot to do with it and, um, and the people you hang around so, but I, I couldn't really fault nobody and put the blame on nobody but myself because I'm the one that choose to do that so just because them them people do what they do don't mean that you got to go down the same path that they go. So once I turned 16, I remember getting out of DYS. And, um, I thought my life was going to be better, but it just got worse. <laughs> and I started hanging around the same people, doing the same thing. And I just thought it was cool. And I found myself in DYS again for another year. And once I turned 17, I figured, well, this ain't the life to live. So I need to find some kind of other thing to do or other people to hang around with. And uh, maybe I can live a better life. And at the age of 17 and a half, <laughs> I just choose to stay around them same people. And for some reason, I couldn't understand why I was so attracted to negative people. And even though you're doing alcohol and you're doing drugs, back then my, my choice wasn't drugs, it was alcohol. And, you know, maybe that was because my whole family drank and that's all I seen them doing was drinking. So that's, that might be the reason I choose to do what I did, but now after I got out of DYS, I knew deep down inside that once you still commit crimes and the older you get, they got a place for you and it's called prison. And my first experience with that was 18 and a half. <laughs> for some reason, it's always the half part. <laughs> you get another year and then you get another half, you seem that you're getting grown. And I remember my first wife, which is my oldest kids, I have two, I have a total of four boys now, I forgot to mention. I've got my son Matthew, which is 27, he's in the military, he's in Germany. I've got another son, Brandon, is 22, he lives in Springfield, Ohio. The mother of Brandon and Matthew, we moved out my mom's house when I was 18, because she was staying with me. And we got our own apartment. Now to make ends meet, I figured, well, I use I know how to steal, so why don't I just have her help me steal? So we started going to the mall and I would bust people's windows out and break in their car. And you know, steal good stereos, radar detectors, anything that we I can get my hands on and uh, trade them in for money so I can pay the rent and get alcohol. Now, I failed to 
to mention that my first wife, her family was Christian. And how I ended up with her, I do not know. Because <laughs> she was, her, her mother and father had no TV. They used a monitor. They wore no makeup. They wore skirts. They, they was in the Bible every day. Revivals, church, Wednesdays, Sunday mornings, Sunday evening. And for some reason, she was just drawn to me. And I, I couldn't understand why. So about 18 and about 19 years old, that's when I first had Matthew. And um, I think he was two years old when I was on my way back to prison again. This time for stealing again. So back then, I just, I had, for some reason, I had a problem with keeping my hands off the of stuff that wasn't mine. <laughs> And I mean, some people could say it was young. I just think it was stupidity. <laughs> and uh, it was childish. Because, you know, as time went on, and I can remember when I was 20 years old, that I came out one side and here I get in my nice car, and somebody done busted out my window, <laughs> and my radio was gone. <laughs> so after that, I figured, well, maybe. Stealing ain't so good. <laughs> After somebody that got me, I, I don't think I want to steal no more because now I know how these people feel. So once I got out of prison for that, the first, I think that was either first or second time, I was introduced to uh, crack cocaine. Now, a lot of people out here know what crack is. And I wish my family could have, out of Springfield could have been here because he was a big reason I was introduced to it. And we used to go to Dayton, Ohio. We would get crack. And back then, you could get it for so cheap and cut it up and make a lot of money off of it. But the thing is, we was using it too at a young age. Back in 88, 89, that's when crack was really a, a bad drug. And people were really hooked on it. So once I started doing that, the money started flowing, and um, I found a better hobby. <laughs> Even though it was a bad hobby, I found a better hobby. I figured, well, unless I'm not stealing nobody's stuff, now I can sell drugs. So I started selling drugs around 20, 21, and um, just to make ends meet, as time went on, I see that that wasn't right either. Because something in the back of my head always told me, you, you know what's right, what's right from wrong. And I tried, and even the times that I was in prison, I would always pray to God and ask him, God, be with my family, be with me while I'm in here, watch over me. And it, I know each time I asked him to do something, I feel that prayer came true because I was never physically harmed, hurt, or nothing in prison. None of my family died while I was in prison. None of them was hurt. It seemed like every prayer that I asked God to do, it was answered. But I just, if I could look back, maybe I should have answered his prayer and did what he asked me to do, be a good guy. <laughs> but I couldn't do that. You know, I don't know if I was blind or just couldn't see. I don't, I don't know what it was. But as time went on, uh, I still continued to commit crime. And my last major crime that I committed that really iced the cake is uh, I was about 25 years old. And, uh, I was still in the selling drugs and somebody owed me $3,500. I had uh, front of, literally what you call front of them drugs. Well, they didn't give me my money. And I decided to run up in their house while their family was in there and get my money. And I held some people in the house and told him to go get my money. He didn't go get my money, he went and got the police. So, <laughs> and uh, 
I ended up getting caught because the police was out there told me to go on, and I ain't had no intentions on really hurting the family. I just really wanted my money. But as I look back, that $3,500 wasn't, wasn't worth doing the time I did. I ended up doing, I had 525 for the burglary, and no, I had three to 15 for the burglary, and five to 25 for the kidnapping, and then I had another extortion charge. So they ran them all together, and I had five to, 50, five to 25. I did seven years. I was in there from 1993 to 2000. I got out in 2000, and in the meantime, from 93 to 2000, my mom would always made sure my kids was up there to see me, made sure they visited me, made sure she visited me, made sure I had money on my books and everything. And I, I, had, I had a wonderful mom, but also was the man upstairs to make sure that she had it to make sure I had it. So, but when you're, when you're living a life like that, you can never, uh, you can never just realize how God is so good for you. And a lot of times when you're doing drugs and you're doing alcohol, you're not even thinking about God. But he's really the one that's watching over you. It ain't nobody, y'all. It ain't the police. <laughs> it ain't your buddy. It's God that's watching you. So, once I got out in 2000, I was paroled down here to Highland County. And I, I got remarried to a, an older woman that I met while I was in prison. And, um, I got out July 2000. And I remember coming down the hills real high, and I was just like, Lord, what did I get myself in? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, can I share this story? <laughs> but uh, I was out about five months, and uh, I remember me and my wife, and this is another thing about alcohol, me and her was drinking wine together. and. Two alcoholics drinking wine, especially Mad Dog 2020, it, it, it's, not, it's not gonna get better. So we end up fighting, she called the police, I went to jail. I didn't know what to do. So when she called the police, I was so scared, cause I, I, I didn't even know really what county I was in. I just know I got paroled to Highland County, but I didn't know what Highland County was. All I knew was Clark County and Montgomery County. At Springfield and Dayton. That's all I knew. I didn't know what Highland County was. So, while the police was outside, I locked the door, put the couch up to the door, and told them I wasn't coming out. I don't know what y'all gonna do to me, and I'm not coming out of the house. So, and, and I'm quite naturally, anybody can look it up in the news thing, you can probably find it. Back in 2000, December. And it was all, what we was arguing over was money. Material money. Money. That's all it was, was money, was material thing. So after two hours, I got arrested, and they took me down to jail. I stayed in jail for about three months. But as all women do, and not I'm not going to say all women. <laughs> yeah, wow. I know I'm not one. Back the tape. Back the tape. Back the tape. Don't no tears in front of me. But majority of the abused women, seem to always go back to the man and get him out of jail. And that's what she did. She got me right back out of jail. After putting me in there, even went down to the, even went down to the ju judge in front of my pro officer and all and literally lied and said I did not do none of that. And you know, you look back at that too, part of it has to do with love, but a lot of it has to do with stupidity because if two people you can't get along, there's no sense of fighting and uh, hurting each other because, you know, eventually somebody's going to get hurt to where you're, uh, you're really going to regret it in the end. And I can't say that after we had split up that I still didn't have problems with women. And my mother was never, I could never, never understand why I'd always want to, put my hands on a woman or something, because my mother was never abused. 
and I've never seen her get abused. So I don't know where it came from, but I did have that that anger built up in me to where I always would want to put my hands on the lady, and I, I couldn't understand where it came from. But uh, after I got out of jail, my mother, well, let me back up, because uh, I got out in J July of 2000. Three weeks after I got out, my mother passed away. And I think what it was, she had diabetes, and I think from me doing seven years that she wanted to wait until I got out so she wouldn't pass away while I was in jail, while I was in prison. But she passed away three weeks after I got out. And then, and I say that because I think that was something, another gift from God, let me be there beside my mother at her funeral. Because there's a lot of people in prison that don't even get to go to their, their family's uh, funeral. But it was a blessing to me to get to go and see her bury and carry her casket. But uh, after I did them uh, three months in jail, I had a funeral bill I needed to pay. And one of my closest friends in Springfield introduced me to big drugs. So I was fronted with drugs. And so now I had a deception that I could come down here Highland County and uh, distribute drugs. So I was down here distributing marijuana to different people. I put some over in Hillsboro, put some in Leesburg, put some in Lynchburg, and that's where I met Nick. <laughs> and Nick, and for people who don't know Nick, Nick is my guest. And he, he I really look at him like he's my a son to me because he hung around with my son and he was one of the first kids I actually met down here on the wrong term, a negative term, and that's how I met Nick. But there was some times that, uh, there was some good times and there was some bad times. But, uh, and there was one, and just like in the in uh, principles that where you, uh, need to make amends at the end of this. I'd like to make amends for him. Because once I go through my story, you'll understand why I'd like to make amends. But um, anyway, March, April 2000, uh, 2001, I think uh, I violated my parole. I don't know, I can't remember exactly what I was violated it for, but I was sent back to prison again for another year. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was a DUI. It was, had to do with alcohol. And I got a DUI and was sent back for another year on that. So I got out in 2002 and continued to, you know, sell drugs and try to work now. And that's when I was introduced to uh, Turning Point. And I started going to Turning Point, working. I had a, I had a nice, decent job. I was head of uh, shipping and receiving. I ran the tow motor. Uh, I even uh, bus girls to uh, Adams County, Pike County. You know, I had a good job, but I, I, for some reason, I still wanted to keep that money in my pocket. And I still continue to sell drugs. Uh, I did that for about two, three years, and uh, I met a young girl in there, which uh, she was real young, 17 and a half. I didn't, I, I, I know, <laughs> I know, a lot, I, I'm not, I'm a, I gotta be honest, a lot of had to do with the beauty of the girl, but I knew the age wasn't right. I've been locked up with so many people that I knew it wasn't right. <laughs> but um, I just told her thank you that, you know, when you get 18 and maybe we can do something. But she was so, in, she was so consistent 
on wanting to be with me and her parents didn't didn't see see her. For one, and you know, you gotta be honest, for one, it was it was the color and two it was the age. And um after about three or four months she was just rebellious and her mom just said, you know, you just do what you want with her because she's not gonna listen. Well they took her car, they did everything, they tried to ground her, everything. And so I ended up moving her in with me and uh it was the worst thing I ever did. <laughs> Cause she was, a, and I, I've told other people about this, she was very childish and they would say, I wonder why. <laughs> She's only 17 and a half. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah. So after about two years, me and her, uh, we didn't, we really couldn't, you know, after 2004, we, we just really couldn't get along. And uh, after she, uh, we split up, I met my wife now, Elizabeth, at turning. <laughs> and uh, they got in a big fight, so I ended up choosing Elizabeth, but I still <laughs> had feelings for the young girl. I'm not going to lie, you know, because I figured I ruined her whole relationship with her family. And uh, I, I I had feelings for her. I could even remember sometimes I'd be talking to her on the phone and Elizabeth would be here, my wife, and I would tell her I still love her. And I know what was wrong. But at that time, I still did. I still have a feeling. But God has blessed her now with a good husband. She, she lives in Texas. We do not talk, but I've talked to her aunt, and God has blessed her with three beautiful children, a good husband that's in the military. So her life is good, and something did come out of it. And I think, as I look back, I think I was more of a father figure to her than a, a boyfriend or a future husband, but in the meantime, God blessed me with a good wife too. You know, I've got Elizabeth, and we had Xavier in uh, 2006, and then around 2006, right after a month I had him, I was at my in-laws, and we was drinking, once again alcohol, drinking, and um, My wife assaulted my brother-in-law's mother for some reason because she came up with the cop and she left and we thought everything was fine. I took my wife and the, my newborn baby home. He was only 30 days old and uh, I dropped her off. My, my second oldest son was down here and he said he forgot his phone up there. So I went back up there to get his phone and I was arrested for the assault. And as I, as I read my transcripts and stuff, and what it was is the lady had uh, told him that the reason me and my wife had sold her is because I had 40 pounds of weed in my truck. And uh, she had brought the law over there, which was a lie, but at that time, the police had been wanting me anyway. And uh, it was kind of the worst thing to do because you just have a a little baby, and I, and I can remember the time that my dad went there for Father's Day. And then when I get arrested, I go to prison. My son fell in that same category. But, but as time went on, you know, the whole thing is I did not even touch the baby. But once they went to my house, they found what the lady said she thought I had in my car. I didn't have it in my car. I had it at home. And <laughs> which <laughs> I mean, it was wrong, but the way the whole thing went, to get how it got it, it was just, it was a man's worst nightmare. And they tore my whole house up. 
They took free vehicle, twenty thousand dollars, ten pounds a week. They took my wife to jail. Took all my dog, took the dog too. <laughs> and I kind of felt bad because when I was sitting in that jail, I was like, my wife didn't know nothing about. It. She knew what I did, but she didn't know about the drugs being in the car. So I. Uh, I went ahead and went and did my time. And I got out a year later, because they only gave me a year. They really wanted the money. They gave me my vehicle back after two years. They gave me everything. They took out my garage. They didn't give me the money back. They confiscated that. <laughs> confiscated the drug. But I got out in 2007. Matter of fact, it was, I can't, I remember it. Because it was uh, like four days before my son's first birthday. So that was a blessing from God yes. <laughs> that I could see him, you know, blow out that first candle for his first birthday. You know, even though I did what I did to him. But I was out for six more months and I still, I was on parole, so uh, I still had to answer to all that weed I had. <laughs> they gave me the year for violating parole. So I took a plea agreement, which they gave me all my vehicles back, gave me my son's money back, they took off of it, and gave me everything out of the house back. My security camera and everything. And I had to go and do another year. And, and then again, that was, you know, that was 2007. So I had to do from 2007 to 2008. And, um, Since then, you know, from 2008, once I got out of prison, I'm not gonna lie that I was still selling drugs once I got out. So when I came down here, I couldn't find a job, and I know, and I know people who probably think, "Man, what would you think?" <laughs> and I don't blame you. I, I wish I could sit down with each and every one of y'all. Maybe y'all can tell me what I was thinking, because I know it was stupidity. You know, the many times I've been to prison that I, I, I should have known it was wrong. And uh, from 2000 until 2000, uh, 2010, I was doing good. Even though I was still breaking the law, I was kind of running a skid business and uh, selling drugs on the side too. And something just told me that you needed to stop before things get worse. But I had to try to make one more big score. And I decided to purchase some pills out of Columbus, Ohio. And uh, coming back, sheriff ran my tag and I was under suspension. And he pulled me over and he was gonna let me go. But uh, when he searched my car, I had Percocets and Vicodins in my car. And uh, so I told him, well, looks like you busted me. And I don't think it hit me as hard this time because my kids was a little older. And I didn't, I think they have been through it so much now that they would probably just use the dad going to prison. And uh, it's still sad, but that's the, the life I, I, I tried to live back then. But in 2011, in January, I remember one day, I, I started going uh, before, before I went back to court, I started going to drug class at Sciota Paint Valley. And uh, I met Rusty, <laughs> Russ, <laughs> Russ Hill. And uh, he used to try to check me out and figure me out. And I used to see him look at me. <laughs> and uh, back then, and Nick came out that he hit the nail with the hammer right on the head that I kind of kept a big ego, this 
macho man thing. Not saying that I wasn't rough and I ain't tough, but <laughs> I kind of, I kind of kept a guard around me. I didn't want nobody, you know, to harm me, harm my family or nothing. I just had to keep a big ego. And uh, I'd always hear refs talking about real life and church. And I'm like, man. And he told me how he he, he beat his addiction and uh, what God had did for him. But at that time, I wasn't trying to hear that. I'm trying to hear what am I going to tell this judge of Columbus, Ohio, about being killed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Russ was like, man, I was, I just was going to church and uh, I gave my life to the Lord and then I went to court and I think, I can't remember if he said the pastor went with him and, and I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, and they, they gave me probation. I'm like, what church you go to? <laughs> like, real life. And so, uh, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget this. But that, that man, I, I, now I'm thinking now, real life church, probation. So, uh, I remember telling everybody in the class, they was like, will you come the next week? I was like, well, I don't know, man. I got, I'm going for a sentencing deal, and I might uh, take a deal. And I said, matter of fact, I was supposed to take, I, I already copped out, and I was supposed to go for sentencing, and they was possibly going to give me a year of prison. And I was, deep down, I, I, I was so tired of committing crimes and living that lifestyle. I was ready to do that a year, but do something constructive with this time that I went to prison, instead of just sitting there and eat little Debbie Swiss roll cake, <laughs> play basketball and all that. But uh, Russ was like, uh, hey man, you ever gonna go to church? And I was like, I'll tell you what, I'll go to court next week. If I don't go to prison, I'll be in church. And I think that man upstairs, <laughs> he said, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> and that's the only thing, that's one thing about me. If I tell you I'm going to do something, that's all I got is my word. <laughs> and there's a lot of people since then that I've asked to come to church and stuff like that. And they're like, well, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll come, just give me a call when you call. Oh, I'm tired flat or I got a cold or something like that. But I can remember when Russ asked me and I said, I said, uh, if I don't go to prison, I will come. And that next week, I went to court. <clears throat> I, I probably didn't even get to walk down the escalator. And Russ called me and said, well, looks like you ain't in prison. <laughs> Well, I know. I'll be there Sunday. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been coming to real life. And uh, God has shown me another life. Amen. Yes. And uh, he's did a lot of things for me and my family. And he's blessed my wife with a good job. You know, he's looked over my son while he's in the military over in Germany. My son has blessed me, gave me money to buy a house so we can try to make some kind of investment, even though it gave me a couple of gray hairs. <laughs> the Lord, uh, Lord has been good to me. And I say that because Nick, Nick knows who I am. He's going to probably know me probably almost as much as my family in Springfield knows me. But, uh, and that, that's why I, you know, before ending this, how much time we got? Before ending this, I just, uh, <clears throat> there was a time that, uh, I'm going to share this, all right? There was a time that uh, I had drugs. And I was drinking so much, and the last time, it was me and another friend that was hanging around and we were drinking. And we got drunk, and I remember giving him some drugs because he moved a lot of drugs for me, and the other guy moved a lot of drugs for me. But uh, I was so drunk, I couldn't remember where I put my drugs and my money. And the last time I checked my surveillance camera, the only ones I seen was him and another dude. And uh, 
for a whole month, I was just, uh, I, was, I, I, I literally wanted to kill him. And I, I went down his house and I disrespected his mom. You know, I chased the other boy through his grandma's house. His grandma and them just sit there. They didn't know what to think. And all this time that it was in my cabinet behind some uh, stuff and I could never tell him that I was sorry, man. I apologize for that, man. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't have did that. And there's people out there, like, there's people out there still now that owe me money. And we're not talking 10 $20. But, you know, serving the Lord. I got to let it go. Because if not, I find myself right back in prison. And I do, I got a lot of anger. But you got you got to just think, and it's money, cars, stuff, and just material things. Amen. And he tell you, man, there's, I got a lot of people to owe me money. And probably if I could just sit back and just get them all in this room and they get my money, I would never have to work again. <laughs> But it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Yeah. It's really not. I really just keep serving the Lord. Just, yes. I know where I'm going. Amen. I know where I'm going. Yes, and I just want to apologize to him. And I, I thank God brought us back together because uh, he still talked to me. Even after what I did to him and the others, he still talked to me. And uh one day he called me and he's like, you know I ain't meetings? As a matter of fact, it was two weeks, week, two weeks ago, he said, you know I ain't meetings I go to? And I was just getting ready to come to uh, celebrate the victory. And I was like, I got something better. <laughs> I said, I'll pick you up. And, you know, I wanted to call him today. But in, in reality, I was giving him a test, you know, because I brought, I invited another guy here. But he's still in, he's still in his his lifespan right now. So I'm, I'm not the kind that to, to force somebody into something. And I kind of get I kind of get disappointed when I try to testify to somebody or you know invite them to something and they tell me one thing and do the other. I kind of get angry like that. So I can just I can give you my opinion, give you some advice and invite you and just leave it to your mind if that's what you want to do. Because I had to figure out the same thing. Is this what I want to do? And like I tell everybody, you know, it, it don't cost nothing to come in here. And once you get the word, I mean, you're going to like it, you know. Because you, you feel much at ease, much better. I just, uh, I just really want to apologize to him.